So we're going to look at task four of the internal controls um, mock. And I like this task because it, it really gets you what, when I was studying, uh, it was called playing the game. Um, you really got to get yourself in the scenario and, and vision what would you do if you were you uh, there in the scenario. So let's, so if you can actually see what I'm talking about, bring up the scenario. Cool. You should be able to see that. Okay. Bring it up. I've been doing this for three years now, but I always check. Uh, you can see task work, aren't you? Yeah, cool. So, so before I get into this question, the reason why I, I like this question is previously I've seen questions on internal controls and the, one of the questions was, what are the issues for the company? And one of the things was, um, there were, didn't have enough credit controllers or something other. And a student would answer saying, what's the, what, what are the issues to the company? The credit controllers overworked and stress and obviously for the credit controller being stressed is a bad thing but that would get no marks because it is not what you asked you were asked for the issues for the company so a question like that you say the credit controller is overworked which would then lead to things being missed debts not getting chased and then debts going bad which is the issue for the company so you've got to be sure uh, be, able to be careful as to who the uh, question is referring to and make sure you don't start giving potential impacts for someone else and not what we've been asked for. So in this scenario, we are, we have just joined the central services team of Downton Instruments Limited. I mean, that's what our scenario based on. So we, as in you and me, have joined the central service team for Downton Instruments Limited. Now we've given some scenarios, but before we go through that, I like to jump to the question and get clear in mind as to what we are being asked to do. So we've been to identify four weaknesses. And then for each weakness, explain the potential impact on you and the potential impact on the company. So we need to be very clear that in this box here, the potential impact for you is you being affected. Not something that is obviously an issue, but an issue for the company, because whilst it's a great answer, if it's not in this column here, you will get no marks for it. So you need to make sure that you put your issue for the for the person that it is in the right column. So make sure you are answering the question. The other thing I want to highlight is identify. Yeah, pen to work. Uh, identify and explain. So what are we looking for in an identify type question? Yeah, Sarah's right. State what it is and nothing more. Just what is the weakness? We don't want any, well, you can do it, but you're not going to get any marks. The mark scheme is very prescriptive. Now, remember these marks. These mocks are all marked by different people. You can't have one person going to mark them all. So to make sure it's consistent, AAT have a very prescriptive mark scheme. So to identify a weakness, you will, you won't get, you know, any more marks than if you sit and write a huge essay on it. You're going to get the same number of marks as someone say, this is the weakness. So identify, we want a very short, succinct answer. Because any more than that, you're just wasting your time. Whereas explain is looking for a lot more in depth. So make sure that if, if it does say explain, you go in a lot more detail. So sometimes I see questions and it's identify six weaknesses. If you just identify six weaknesses, I just want bang, 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 six bullet points and you're done. I don't want huge long essays of six different points and why it's a weakness and what they can do to fix it and who that affects because you're still going to get the same six marks as someone who just goes 
bang, 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 bang with six points. So make sure you are giving me what you want, but also giving it in the level of depth that we want. And the question will dictate that. So to recap, we need to identify four weaknesses. And then for each weakness, explain the impact on you and the impact or potential impact on the company. So is everyone clear what we need to do? Now, we haven't even looked at the scenarios yet, but we now know what we need to do rather than just reading it, then finding what we need to do, and then having to go back and find a weakness. So let's go back through the scenario. So we've recently joined. Our interview was conducted by John Anderson, the office manager. Any issues with that, can you think? You can say no. Yeah, I'd agree with Sarah. Yeah, it's not the end of the world. Ideally, when I do interviews, I like to have two people there, but that's only because I've got a shocking memory. So after the interview, uh, someone else can prompt my memory. Because I think, yes, that's a good point. Or no, they didn't do very well on that. Uh, but th I don't see an issue with that. Now, the company is no human resources manager, which it's not brilliant, but not every company has a human resources manager. So it's not the end of the world. Now, John telephoned us to let us know that we had the job and discuss details with regards to working hours, pay rate, and obtain your bank details. Any issues we spot, spotted here? Yeah. The offer was made. Pen to work. Over the phone. So... Yeah, like, like nothing in writing. You know, if it was me and you got offered a new job, you get all excited, you get a new job, and then you put the phone down, you go and speak to your partner and say, oh, I've got a new job. And they go, oh, that's great. And you're like, oh, what, what, you know, what they're offering you? What to put in your life? I forgot all that. Um, so we've got nothing in writing in regards to working, uh, you know, working hours. You know, we, we might have a dispute. Get a pen to work. Over pay, for example, you might have remembered it as being X, and then it's Y. You might have dispute over hours, and you know even you know starting date or something. You might turn up on the wrong date. You might not turn up on time. So that's the impact on you. What's the potential impact on the company? Now, you're right, there are no records, but what is the impact of no records? Now, no records is the cause, but what would actually be the downside to Downton Instruments? So, if you've got an employee asking for X, and you think you're going to pay them why you've got a choice do you pay them um x amount or do you argue against them and in that case then do you upset a new employee and then no in that case then do you end up losing them so you've got no records you do, you, you've got you've got nothing to say that this is what you agreed to this is what you expect to do um and like that um yeah the employee does not exist i mean you probably struggled side that because obviously you've offered them a job and someone has turned up to work um so from the, the company's point of view they're offered a job to someone and someone's turning up but it's more there is nothing you know agreed 
about working hours or pay rate or anything like that. What other weakness could we get out of this as well? Now, I'm not a massive fan of um, trying to make more points out of one thing. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. So obviously, stuff that's agreed, so they've got a dispute between what they thought and what you thought, but then also, you know, obviously it goes one way. You told, they were told you what you get paid. They also told, oh, sorry, we also told them our bank details. So, so we told them bank details over the phone. Again, it was taken over the phone. There's always a chance of it being um, you know, heard incorrectly, written down incorrectly. Um, and then Deborah misreading his handwriting, maybe. So that would be a separate issue to the dispute between you and the, well, sorry, us and the company. So what would be the potential impact on us? Yeah, we might not get paid. Or, you know, worst case scenario, if they got the bank details wrong, paid late. So then what would be the potential impact for the company? So if you've got the wrong bank details for an employee and you go to pay them, exactly, you pay the wrong person, exactly right, and then what is the ultimate, yeah, that's exactly right, you might end up losing money because you can't get that money back, say, or you're out of pocket for a while because you've got to, you've paid that one person and then you can get the money back if you ask the bank, maybe, depending on the bank, but you, it won't be straight away, so you're out of pocket. What else would be an impact for the company if you paid your employee late? Yeah, you damage your reputation with the employee or the relationship with your employee. So that's it. I mean, it's, what, it's, it's not a uh, financial cost, but there are non-financial costs that we can bring in as well. It doesn't all have to be uh, money. Cool. So we've got as far as then. Next one. He's passed his details on to Deborah, the payroll manager by email. John told you that your contract would be ready to sign on your first day, but so far you've not received it. Now, I'm not going to ask you, what's the, uh, clearly, that's shocking. Um, you've got no contract. So that's the weakness, we've identified weakness. What is the impact on you? Oh, when I say you, us, I should say, really. So if you haven't got a contract and you're working for someone, what's the addition? Yeah, Anne, um, you've got nothing to stand on. You haven't got a signed contract between you and your employer. You know, they can, I mean, extreme example, they can sack you with no recourse because there's, there's no contract of employment. Yeah, no legal obligation to be paid. You've got, uh, you, probably, you don't know your notice period, which if you haven't just been paid, you might be looking to see what your notice period is. 
And also the other thing, I mean, you could go on forever, like, what don't you know? You know, your sick policy, do you get full pay or SSP? So there's lots there, you know, you know, it's not great for the employer. What about the employer? What are the potential impacts for the employer of an employee not signing a contract? Exactly. The employee can just leave. Anything else? Not insured on premises. I never thought of that, Matthew, but I think that is a really good one. Anything else? I mean, I actually think about that is a really good point. But what would do is take that a little bit further, that if something were to happen, you could get uh, a large penalty that your insurance provider wouldn't pay out if something would happen. But yeah, I do like that. Um, now, one thing I'm going to say is quite a good story is this. Um, well, the first thing is they haven't agreed. To your well, I don't like the phrase terms and conditions, but they haven't agreed to abide by you know your um behavior policy, your whatever policy, um, things like that. Because I once worked at a place, not here, but um someone was given a laptop and um they took the laptop home and then they handed the notice in and they disappeared with the laptop and at that point there we looked at the contract they hadn't signed anything to say we'll return all with uh company policy and things like that um and so it was very hard getting a laptop off them because we had, they didn't have much legal dispute and the other one which uh i do know um we're going to know how i know but also in your contract you might have what is known as a non-compete does anyone not know what a non-compete is? Yeah. So a non-compete is when someone, an employee, agrees that for a certain period of time, they won't canvas your customers, they won't share insider knowledge, they won't um, contact clients of yours for a certain period of time. Now, if they've not signed a contract to that, they come and work for you. They get to know all who your customers are and things like that. And then they can just disappear because you've got no contract empl employment. They can just walk out. They haven't got a notice period. And then they can just take all your clients and you've got no recourse about that. Um, I know where someone that actually happened. And so, right. So there's lots of things you can go with non compete. And again, non compete, I would take that a little bit further just to say the non compete isn't the implication the non-compete would lead to the implication of loss of clients because you're not protected for that yeah it, it depends how reasonable the non-competes are um i knew someone who had a non-compete where it said you must never ever have any contact either professionally, socially with anyone who's worked here ever. I remember thinking, that is not going to stand up in a court of law. Um, yes, it can deter. Let's just say, <laughs> I know how much employment lawyers, uh, employment solicitors cost, and it's not cheap per hour. And if it was me, I'd just rather not get involved in a dispute over a non-compete, if I'm being honest. Um, Accounts and training wills a great industry to work in, to be honest. Um, but yeah, but yeah, and you left yourself up. But generally, if you're a normal, upstanding member of society, you wouldn't go to a company, work there for a week and steal all their clients because that's a horrible thing to do. Anyway, we're going off on a tangent here. Um, anyway, next one. So it's now month end. 
and you've actually have been paid, they've written down the um, salary correctly, it's gone into the right bank account, um, but you've not received a pay slip. Obviously, that's the one we're going to go with. It's, it's pretty obvious. So what is the impact on you for not having a pay slip? Yeah, so there's, there's quite a few actually there, there, Sarah. So the first thing I would say, you the first thing, you can't check your gross pay. So you don't know if what they're paying you is what you've agreed. What else on there that we would like to check? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, not even I sit and work out that my calculations on my tax and everything is correct. But what I, I would do is check my um, you know, tax code. So I have been in a situation where I was put on like, a, and you don't need to know this, uh, an M1 code, which means to tax you like it's month one every single time. And it's quite a low tax code. So I was paying a lot of tax. I then got a notice through the post that the HMRC started on my tax code and it's not going to be an M1 code and it's going to be a lot higher. So I'll get a tax refund. And for three months solid, the payroll uh, firm that we outsourced it to just forgot to update my tax code, which was beyond annoying because I was due a tax refund. So every month I would check to see if I had my tax uh, tax code changed because that would lead to a tax uh, refund. So if you've got a tax code error, again, that's not the implication. The tax code error leads to being over taxed or under taxed. Now, what is the worst to be taxed, over or over taxed or under taxed? Yeah, I agree, Sarah. Under tax is worse because you get the money, you assume it's yours, you spend it, and then you've got to go and find some money. Over tax is good, you get a little bonus when it all works out. Yeah, under tax is worse. Really. So you'd want to check your tax codes. The other thing you might want to check on there is, is your pension contributions. Uh, make sure that you actually have have a pension contribution taken off. They haven't forgotten that. Perhaps they've forgot to put you in the pension scheme. Um, what else might you like to check? And I think someone actually mentioned it, uh, which is a really good suggestion. Did someone say it? Yes, yeah, so year to date. Because obviously you have, I mean, this is going into a bit of realms of payroll. You don't really need to know. Um, but your year-to-date figures, make sure that they have carried along correctly from your previous employer. Because remember, we've only just joined and the odds are we didn't join on the 6th of April. And so they've come across and they are being taken into account. Yeah. And overtime, perhaps we've done some overtime this month and that's been put on. I have workplaces where overtime has been missed. Um, so you want to make sure that all they're correct. And the, the ultimate implication is you've been paid correctly or you haven't been underpaid. You haven't been underpaid in terms of salary or you haven't been uh, under tax and you've got to pay some tax down the line or over tax. It's not the end of the world. You'll get it back. What about the potential impact on the company? Now, remember the, where the weak. Now, make sure we get back in the scenario. The weakness was because the pay slip was in the printer or broken the printer. So we have run the payroll. We presumably can get the payroll reports off. So it would be a tangible impact on the business.
Yeah. Employee relationship is a good one. Now, what would you do? Oh, well, that and it's illegal to not provide a pay slip. Um, you know, you, I don't think you'll get as far as a, a fine or anything like that, but you are quite right. It is illegal not to provide a pay slip and a P60 and things like that. Yeah, time taken to reprint when the print is fixed. Um, I'm going to put that in because. Now, what about if you underpaid your employee by quite a lot and your employee just accepted it or wasn't? Say, for example, you were going to pay them on the 30th and all their direct debits go out on the 1st. They don't get a pay slip until they see the money come in. By that point, all the direct debits are going out. What else could happen? Yeah, the employee goes overdrawn. And so, but but remember, what is the impact on the company in this part of the question? And again, that's right. The employee will be charged interest on the bank. What's the implication for the company? Reputation I'd put under uh, employee relationship. And again, it was, when you say unethical, if it is a genuine mistake, oh, that's not great. Yeah, you might actually have to pay the bank charges because say someone got a load of bank charges for bouncing direct debits um, and, you know, the employees out of pocket through your errors, um, you think of the company, they would sort that out really. So you don't have to pay in the day you send pay slips. You don't have to pay the day you send pay slips. Um, I get my pay slip a couple of days early. Presumably just so I could check it. And if there wasn't an error, they could sort it out before actual payday. Um, why is this coming up? Well, if you think, if you if you were meant to get paid £2,000 net and the and company made a mess of your payroll and paid you £500 net and you've got mortgages you've got gas and electric which is probably more than two thousand pounds anyway um and all they bounce all they bounce because of you making error in the payroll you know the employee should not be standing that i mean if you don't i think the employee would be more than fuming i'm saying so the company might have to stand them um if they make an error with payroll whereas if they're given a pay slip in advance any errors can be corrected before the employee finds out on I don't know. Say that say they get paid on the 30th. If they don't look on the morning because they're busy, find out at five o'clock on Friday um on a Thursday and say the direct debits go out on the Mondays, uh, sorry, the Friday, to let do anything about all bounce and the employee is out of pocket. You know, yeah, so I mean we could go on loads of these, but the, the main things I want to stress is you've got to give the impact on the person. So we're looking for the actual impact, what is the effect on them? on the actual person and then for the company it's on the company but what is the actual impact on the company cool cool any questions on that before we move on Cool. So moving on, they are now finally planning on hiring a HR manager, which is a, a good thing. So we've got a drop down box and um, we've got to be. So if we get a HR manager, this should enable what between the HR function and the payroll function. And we've got a choice of physical controls. 
Get my cross out. Segregation of duties and supervision. Yeah, it is segregation of duties. We go to once it's not it, having a HR manager. I don't see how that adds. Well, initially, physical controls. It's just another body. Um, the HR function and the payroll function, one shouldn't supervise another. They are separate things, probably on a par. But it does allow HR to get people on and make sure that they are legitimate people and then payroll to pay them as an example of what you would might want to check. So that gives us segregation of duties, which is always a good thing. Next one, the HR manager will help uphold the company's control of the environment by ensuring that disciplinary procedures are followed or wages and salaries are accounted for correctly. Remember who does what. Yeah, I would go with disciplinary fees because HR manager will do things like give them a formal offer. They will probably actually review salaries every so often, every year, maybe. Um, but they just, once they've told the payroll function that, the payroll function just carries on until they're told. Otherwise, it, they don't really get involved in running the payroll, making sure people are paid correctly, making sure that um, the costs go into the accounts. The payroll journal comes from the payroll department to the financial accounting department, if it's a big firm. HR manager wouldn't get involved in the transfer of the payroll data to the uh, accounts or anything like that. However, it's always that phrase of you don't do it in front of HR because uh, it's a disciplinary thing. So anything like that is not really about payroll and things like that. It's HR is um, having a word with you, should we say. Cool. Last one. The HR managers have reviewed the company's bonus scheme to ensure they, and you've got a choice of one or the other, uh, promote unethical behaviour or affordable to the company. Yeah, Paul, exactly right. So the first one we're going to, well, the only other one we're going to ignore is are affordable to the company. The HR manager possibly wouldn't know. They wouldn't get to see the accounts. They wouldn't get to see the bank account, probably. Uh, that's more like director level, maybe. Um and probably maybe set by the, the owners and something like that. So they wouldn't know what is affordable, but what would they would want to do is make sure that they don't promote unethical behavior. So what HR might do is come up with different bonus schemes. So they might say, right, we've got 10,000 pounds for a bonus scheme and hey, at that point there the manager director probably doesn't care I know he or she probably thinks it's going to cost me 10 grand that's what I care then it's HR to use that 10,000 pounds most effective way and giving it all to one person probably not great uh, but giving you know a bonus to people to work hard obviously because that's why you give a bonus but you might have things like it's given to you in 12 months time and things like that to encourage long-term stability uh, it might be you can have some share options if you stay here for three years and thing so it, it it helps the hr function and not people come in and go in and things like that um rather than very short aggressive bonuses that you you get based on profit that might be manipulated and then people go and things like that um but they definitely wouldn't know if it's affordable or not they wouldn't be set in the bonus structure they would just be coming up with a bonus scheme that fits the the structure that they've given in terms of costs cool in terms of question if you got that in the exam what did, would you think to that
Would that be it? It's not too bad, actually. For those of you sat freshly synoptic, I imagine you think that is a lot easier than task four, freshly synoptic, uh, where you've got a lot of calculations and things like that. Um, it's not too bad at all. And that is the feedback we are getting from people who sit in internal controls now. No one's got the results as yet, so we don't know. But the feedback is it is a lot nicer exam than professional synoptic. Obviously, it's, it's a level four exam. It is not um, you know, a giveaway question. But remember, things like these, these are you know, the drag and drop. There is no negative marking. Do not believe in these blank. Yeah. Um, let me get ahead on this because I've literally just done pestle, but that was business awareness, which also has pestle in, uh, but that's level three. Um, pestle analysis is not a bad one, really. Uh, obviously, you've got to give a factor on, you know, political, economical, social, technological, legal and environmental factors. Um, and all you need to do is come up with a point that fits in there. You don't need to... Um, write massive essays is and you can come up with anything as long as it's sensible and fits one of the other or the factors you've been given to do um the question that i've seen is that, that comes to off the top of my head is give me a political economical and social factor with what's going on in the scenario and then the next question is what are the three remaining uh, factors within uh, within pestle in the model as long as you know this. Uh, is there any pre-release material for this module? You are right. It is. It's a gas company, whatever reason, called um, Downton Instruments Limited. Now, I had this query this week. It still baffles me. A, so you've got some sample assessments. They are not based on Downton Limited or Downton Instruments. <coughs> I don't know why. Honestly, I don't know why. But if you go on the learning portal... The scenario is there, um, and it, the scenario is down to instruments. You know, it's not me going mad. If you go and look, it is there. Um, it, it made me panic for 30 seconds, Sarah. Um, but no, this the exam will be on down to instruments. AAT have confirmed they're not going to change the scenario, which is the best news in the world ever. But I don't know why the AAT sample assessments are not made on down to instruments. Well, actually, I have a feeling I do know why. AAT are not your training provider. AAT are off-qual accredited, and they off-qual want a very clear distinction between training for an exam and being the awarding body. And the AAT sample assessments are not part of your studying for the exam. It is for you to see what the question is like. Now, if you use them for training, that's a different thing. So... You know, they, they are very clear that AT cannot do training. They set the exam and they mark you because Ofqual want, well, Ofqual don't want a, a situation where someone does the training and they set the exam because then there's always that danger they might tweak the exam to prove that their training was really good. So they want to be in a position where AT set the exam and if a college has a miserable pass rate, that's the college's fault not AAT. You don't want a college doing doing the training and a college setting an exam. And if everyone's failing, the college is going to go, well, that's not good. We can't have that. We're going to look really bad. So let's just make them all pass. So that's why we have a distinction between AAT and training. And that's probably the reason why their example assessments are not based on the actual scenario. Uh, yeah, the layout to the new exam is very different to the old ones. You've got less tasks and Whilst there are written tasks, they're a lot smaller. You don't get huge written tasks like you do in PDSY. Cool. Anyone for anything else? Obviously, next week, uh, if you're here next week, uh, we'll be doing task five. And then that's the one. And then we'll go around. We'll probably get some more questions because it doesn't take long to cycle through all of these. Cool. Um, any questions for anything before I let you all go? If you are sitting in exam soon, good luck. Uh, well done to all who got the results today. Um, there's some really good pass rates today.
If not, I will see you all potentially at quarter past six. Um, have I revised my opinion about switching the Q22 to avoid PDSY? Uh, I haven't revised my opinion, but it's strengthened my opinion. If you can, and you can afford to because it costs £100, I would definitely prefer internal controls to fresh and optic. The exam itself does look nicer, and you don't need to know anything from any other unit. It is still a hundred pound. I want to stress that it's a hundred pound to move over mid level. Um, depends how tight you are. I'm pretty tight, but still, it, it, it it's more tempting to me now than it was six months ago. Um, it's I I, I think it'll be a very big difference between the pass rates of PDSY and internal controls. Definitely. There we go. You might pass. All you need is 70%. No one walks out of PDSY going, absolutely nailed that. If you did, you probably misread the questions. No one gets 100% of PDSY, just 70%. Move on with life. That's all you want out of life, so you never know. But yeah, if you can claim it back for employer, I would do it. I would definitely, definitely do it. Cool. Any questions on anything before I let you all go? Uh, Sarah, have the cost of exams gone up? Yes, they have. Uh, 80, you know, they're not daft when it comes to figures. So at each level, there are simply less exams. And 45% of all AAT revenue comes from exam fees. So if you've got less exams, they're going to have less revenue. So what AAT have done is that, so when you book an exam, there is a AAT fee, and then there's an admin fee from the centre for charging you for using their heating and coffee and whatnot. So the AAT fee used to be £49, and then there's an admin fee on top, which has gone up quite a bit recently. Struggled to get one under £100. However, because AAT have less units, they're going to get less £50. So what they've done is put their underlying um, ad, uh, exam fee up to £60. So they get AAT bit, the, the bit AAT charges now £60, and the centre charges an admin fee on top. So in AC, £123 is an awful lot of money. But if you do the full level on um, Call 22, there's one less exam. Now, professional training exams, are they're not cheap. And so it's not like AAT are way more than anyone else. Um, ICAW exams, when I did them, this is over 10 years ago, were £80. And... And if you're, and then they had windows. And if you're a fool like me and you don't book in time, you end up paying double late fees. So I end up paying 160 pound per exam. And this was 10 years, 10 years ago, well, more than 10 years ago, you know, awful lot of money. Yes. And that's a great point is there is no window, which we're all happy about as well. So all the mocks don't come in at once. Course 22 is everything you would want out of being a distance learning provider. Uh, there's no windows, so it all comes in at once. Uh, there's no uh, synoptic, there's no user account with software, there's, um, you know, it's, it's just, there's no changing of the scenario, so people have out-of-date books, it's amazing. Um, AT not considered, just got a bit of a tangent, uh, AT are, you have to have a royal charter to be chartered, and AT don't, and you've got to be, um, it's a level seven qualification, so the only difference is if you're chartered, you can do the three restricted trades, which is insolvency, investment, and uh, audit. And they're the three restricted trades. Other than that, AAT can do everything else that a chartered body can do, uh, as long as you get the practice lines. When we get first set of results? Um, good question. Now, normally, someone sits this exam, we've had someone sit this exam, you got to wait six weeks for the results. However, the first, for every unit, the first 200 have been held back. So as long as 200 people sit this within six weeks, it'll be fine because uh, they're just doing extra tests to make sure it is all right. Um, so as long as people do, it'll be six weeks time. And I think they probably will, but it's more the automatically marked ones at level two and three where 
people are having to wait, which they otherwise wouldn't normally have done because I'd wait for 200 to go through. Um, so I think it's more likely to be five or six weeks for this. It's not going to be loads because this is one loads of people are going to sit very, very soon, if not sat already, because no one wants to sit professional synoptics. So there'll be loads of sittings of this. Whereas if for whatever reason you decided you're going to do auditing on Quals 22 in September, you're probably about the only one in the country. So you'll have to wait a lawful long time for 200 people to sit there. But this one, not so much. So I would imagine it's around the six week marks already because there'll be loads of people naturally wanted to sit this around professional synoptic. That's just my thoughts. I might be completely wrong, but I don't think I am. Cool. Anyone from anything else? We're definitely going down the tangent, but um, I'm here for another 12 minutes. Yep. You got to wait for 200 before you get results. Just so they get a feel for the base underlying pass rates. And they don't want um, the pass rate to be really, really high because the exam's set too easy and people just get given a qualification who otherwise shouldn't be. Likewise, they're going to make it too hard and people all fail and people get angry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm sure 200 people will have sat internal controls uh, by the time you are due to get your results. So, worry about that. Cool. Right. If there's nothing more, I'm going to, um, well, not going to go because I'm still at work too late. But if not, I will see you all at eight, uh, quarter past, no, that's my live, seven o'clock next Thursday evening. Cool.